So we've got a few things to talk about. Um, there's a lot more that's happened in the legislature this year. Uh, we're going to focus on some of the more important parts. We can touch on some of the other things as well. Uh, Christine and I are going to stick around through the break and through the end as well. So if you have questions, feel free to ask us then. So let's, let's dive right into sick leave. So sick leave is fun, right? <laughs> Uh, there was actually a bill right at the end of the legislative session. It was a Department of Transportation bill that they tried to pass that would say, if you're an agricultural employer, this wouldn't matter. And for a lot of reasons, including the fact that they just kind of ran out of time and there wasn't a lot of political wherewithal for it, uh, the bill failed. And now we all have to sit here and talk about it and update our policies. So statewide paid sick leave. So it becomes paid when you are an employer with 10 or more employees. Now Christine went through a big, long, complicated thing to figure out, are you an employee, are you a full-time employee, and how do you count? And the answer for me is, if they're getting wages from you, they're an employee. Okay, we say, well, what about uh, if I have a temporary worker, or a leased worker, or somebody that's not really mine, I'm not paying them W-2 wages, are they still my employee? And the answer to that, at least according to the regs that are proposed right now is, yes, they are. So they're going to increase your employee count. So for most of you guys in the room, though, you're already sitting at 10 employees to start with, so it's not a big deal. But for those of you that are hovering below 10 employees, the fact that you've got, you may have 10 or more uh, when you consider all your temporary employees, your seasonal folks, okay? So let's talk, since we're on the topic here, let's talk about how you figure out whether or not you do qualify as 10 or more employees for a full year. Now, Christine had her own rules and they were really complicated. Mine are a little bit easier. Not a lot easier, but a little bit. So we look on a week by week basis. How many people do you have on payroll or temporary employees to add to that count? So you look at every week. If 20 or more weeks have 10 or more, you now count as an employer with 10 or more employees. See? A little easier. See, I did have better news for you, too. That was good news. They do not have to be consecutive weeks. They do not have to be consecutive weeks. Yeah. So, and let me talk a little bit about the regulations. So, Boley and, and the, the legislature, in their infinite wisdom, have decided they wanted to make this law. Fine. They said the, that we are all going to be bound by this law starting January 1 this year. So, upcoming January 1, we've got a couple more months to prepare for it. Great. This law, like most other laws, aren't completely clear about certain things on the face. We don't know exactly how everything's going to work. So we need regulations for it. Well, what did Boley do? Boley is going to be the agency that's in charge of enforcing this. So they're the agency that's in charge of actually making the rules for it. Boley has now made rules. And actually, they issued some proposed rules that said, <laughs> they issued some rules actually before it went out to the public. And it's pretty typical. They send out rules to some stakeholders say, hey, here's what we're thinking about. What do you guys think? Let's get a little bit of input before we send it out to a broader audience. And it's a pretty smart move to get some input from some from stakeholders that might care about what happens. So they issued that and they said, hey, can you respond to us within about 30 days? Because then, because we really need to get this process going to get these regulations out because January 1's, the date's not changing. So we said, okay, great. And so we start sending them around and we start looking at all these things. And then they issued proposed regulations to the whole public, disregarding anything that the stakeholders had to say, even before the timeline that they had given to say, give us to get the information back to them. And the regulations look completely different than what we saw the first round. So, okay. Now we've got new proposed regulations that are out in the public, and we're waiting for those. So they now, they have to, statutorily, they have to give us a period to say, okay, everybody, bring your comments to us about what you think about the regulations. So they're okay, they're not great, but the whole statute's not great in the first place, so, but they're relatively fair, kind of what we expected to see more or less. That period's gonna end here pretty soon and we're actually supposed to get final regulations not long after we actually have to start complying with the law. Awesome. So what I'm telling you now is gonna be probably updated at some point with what the regulations actually say, and those regulations, of course, are subject to change. So we tend to, uh, we send things out to our clients, we obviously send it to Roberta too, who then can distribute it through their newsletter as well. So you should be getting updated through the Farm Bureau and the Fields Program. All right, now, you guys are all shell-shocked, I can tell. 
there's no, you guys, who's going to go in the break and say, you know what, uh, I need to go talk to a broker about selling the farm. This is, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we've got, we know who this applies to. If you actually do somehow end up uh, with 10, with less than 10 employees, then I've got good news for you. You don't, you don't actually have to pay for the leave. Everything else I'm going to talk about still applies. It's just unpaid leave. Unless, of course, you're in Portland. If you have any operation within the city limits of Portland, anybody here have any operation or any employees within the city of Portland, anybody that works from home from Portland, then it would apply to you. Paid sick leave then applies to you if you have six or nine employees. Does it matter if they travel to Portland and do further work? So what if you have employees that are actually working in Portland? They travel in Portland to, to do their work. That matters. If they're working in Portland, there's like this magical bubble around Portland. And I'm not talking a uh, haze from <laughs> after July 1, we're going to talk about later. Uh, but no, we're, we're talking about Portland has their own sick leave law that says if you are an employer with six or more employees, you have to pay for the leave. So if you somehow fall below 10 and you work in Portland, then at six or more, you have to start paying for the leave. But if it's not regular, it's different too. Like we have one that just travels to pick up parts in Portland. Okay, sure. If they're just traveling through Portland or picking things up in Portland, it doesn't count. They actually have to be working in Portland. So an example would be somebody that works from home on occasion and lives in downtown Portland. They would count as a Portland employee, even though, because again, they're within that magical bubble of Portland. So that qualifies. Okay. I'm not going to spend too long talking about Portland because there's not too many there. Yeah. <coughs> Family members exempt from this count? So are family members exempt from the count? No, not under the current regulations, family members. If they, if they receive W-2 wages, they need to be counted. Yep. All right. So there are, ex I mean, there are exceptions for the rules. Some independent contractors will count, but if they are leased employees, they count. So independent contractors, no. So I hire a plumber, doesn't count. Temporary employees, I hire my seasonal farm workers through a farm labor contractor, they will probably count. Okay. Is that even if you don't pay them? Even if you're not paying them the W-2 wages. That's, I mean, that's why you're hiring the, the labor contractor, right? That's exactly, I don't want to worry about it. I'm not going to deal with it. I don't want to hire them. I don't want to have to fire them. I don't want to have to discipline them. I'm just hiring, go get the job done, right? Well, we're not, and Christine's making a distinction about what a common law employee is, which is a, a good distinction, but one that this law doesn't recognize. This law just says, hey, basically, if you're hiring people on that we're going to do the work of what would otherwise be regular employees, and they, they've listed out in the regulations that we've got now, they list out specifically that temporary farm labor contractors would qualify as employees. So for your count. So when you're not getting even though you're not paying them, even though they're not W-2 waged employees. But yep. How do you take care of, she's asking, like, how do you take care of tracking how many hours they've actually worked and taking care of tracking? Good question. So how are we going to track their hours? And we're going to get into tracking. Whose obligation is it then to track those hours? So you've got a farm labor contractor that's come on, on site. Whose obligation is it to track those hours? Let's make it harder and say they have to do piecework instead of... Oh, good. Hours. Piecework. Yeah, let's make it more fun. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So those are two separate questions, but I'll get, let's get to the first one too. Uh, so whose obligation do you think it is to track those hours? Who's going to say it's going to be the farm labor contractor? Who's going to say it's the farm? It's all of the above. We, you both have a, an obligation. That's why you want to take a look at what your contract says about Who's going to be tracking it? Make sure that that obligation is actually on the farm labor contractor. That if there is an issue with that, the farm labor contractor is going to indemnify you from any and all penalties or losses, right? So we want to make sure that the contract's very clear about if there's a mistake, who's going to pay for it? Because what happened, and keep in mind, so we call it indemnity, right? That means the current contractor needs to make sure that you're made whole. That means from attorney fees, from penalties, anything that's owed to the employee. How much is that indemnity worth? I'll ask you. How much do you think the indemnity is worth? Only as much as the assets that the farm labor contractor has. 
That's it. So the indemnity, you, that's why you want to work with people that you know you trust and you think are going to be around for a long time and probably have insurance for this kind of thing. So is there insurance for wage and hour disputes? There's some. It's usually pretty expensive. So most contractors aren't going to be paying for it. But you want to at least have that indemnity clause. And if not just an indemnity with the contractor, you may want to get an individual guarantee from the owner. It's an idea. A lot of them aren't going to give it to you, but it's something you can ask for. You know, if you still fall within, let's say you bring in those contractors, it's a boatload of them, but it's like 10 weeks or less. You still fall into that under 20 calendar weeks and you still have to pay for the sick leave that you still have to track, right? So, if, if you have uh, a farm labor contractor coming in for less than 20 weeks, and so your count is less than 10 for fewer than 20 weeks, then right, you don't have to pay for the time, but you still have to track it. You still have to give them sick leave. It's just unpaid leave. Okay. All right. All make sense so far? It's going to get more complicated. It's clear as mud. I'm trying to figure out. I'm sure I'm on track. Um, what we were just talking about was just to clarify if you have or less employees if you had to pay for sick leave if you had contractors. I got confused when we started bringing in farm labor contractors. We kind of touched on we're both supposed to record hours if we have to come in, but they pay them for it. They pay them for it. The we're supposed, so, so the, the issue is who's going to be tracking, not only tracking the hours, but then paying the hours, right? The law says that we as, even though we're the, the contractee here, we're not, we're just hiring. We still have an obligation to make sure that the employees are getting their hours and get to take the time off and then getting paid for them. And really that just means we're hiring reputable contractors that know that this law actually exists. So I guess I'm not done with my good news. There's one more piece here for this part of it. Bully has said because everything is so new for everybody, everything is happening so quickly that they're going to hold off a year before they really start enforcing this law. See, good news, right? That is good news. Who has not made that agreement? Plaintiff's attorneys. So, I've had some clients say, well, hey, they're not going to enforce this thing for years, so we're going to do our best, but eh, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I say, well, okay, that's your risk. Because if an employee decides that they want to take the leave or get an attorney and say that you have retaliated against them for using their sick leave or that they haven't gotten all their sick leave, which means they haven't gotten all their wages, which now becomes a wage and hour issue potentially, plaintiff's attorneys may take the case on. So what did this law really do? So we now have to provide all employees in Oregon, regardless of size, with sick leave. Size just matters for pay, right? So. Regardless of size, we have, to, we have to give them the leave. And it is a mini right. How many of you guys have 25 or more employees fall under the Oregon Family Leave Act? Only a few of you want to admit it. Okay, a few more. Good. So this is basically like a mini family medical leave. So employees have a right to use sick leave. We're going to talk about how they get to use it, when, how much notice they have to give you, and then we're going to talk a little bit about strategies on how you can create some policies that may be not the worst ones in the world. Okay. Go ahead. Just real quick before we move on, um, the 20 calendar weeks, those are not consecutive? The 20 calendar weeks that we're talking about do not need to be consecutive. It's any 20 calendar weeks. Okay. Yep. Is the way they're interpreting it now, I wouldn't imagine that's going to change. Okay. All right. So let's talk about accrual. How quickly do people need to accrue it? So, and what do they accrue? Under the law, all employees get 40 hours of leave per year. 40 hours of sick leave per year, unless you want to make it more than sick leave. Okay? So the law just says it's going to be for sick leave, nothing more. They don't get to go hunting with it, they don't get to go to Disneyland, they don't get to do anything else but be sick. Okay? And what are they going to do when they're sick? Well, I'm going to take care if I'm sick, my kid's sick. I have a family member with a serious health condition, and who's a family member? Well, family members include parents, kids, parents-in-law, 
domestic partners to the extent that they're still going to be around for a few more years. Uh, do siblings count? Siblings do not count. Siblings are not family members under the law. Hooray! <laughs> my sister is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, grandparents count, okay? So, and anybody that's acting like a parent to a minor child. So, those are all the people that are in with the family. Grandparents, grandkids, it's basically linear. Two generations up and down and it includes parents-in-law. Okay? That's who your family is. That's who you have to give people time off when there's a serious health condition. Okay? There's all sorts of little leaves stuck in there that you get to take time off for, like domestic violence leave. If your employee or their minor child is a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, they get to take the leave. If your employee or their minor child is a victim of a violent crime, basically a felony, they get to take the time off to go watch the guy go to the trial and watch the guy get put away. Okay? So there's a lot of little leaves stuck into what sick leave actually is. The new regulations also make it clear that parents get to take time off for their children. You're thinking, well, no duh, you just said that, David. Thank you very much. Well, I said for their minor children. They also get to take off time for all of their children for any illness that might keep them away from work or school, is how these new regulations read. That means if I have a 50-year-old employee that wants to take their 30-year-old son to the dentist to get a tooth extracted, that's sick leave. That's protected. Okay? So that's how broad this sick leave is. Again, it's not going to be for vacations unless you want to make it that way. So now they've got 40 hours. Yeah, go ahead. Does Foley have this? Uh, or is there a write-up of this somewhere that we can, that we can get? So is there a write-up of this somewhere? There, of the regulations, yes. So Bully has that on their website. Uh, I think Roberta's got a copy of the proposed regs. I can, yeah, I'll get Roberta a copy of it, or you can email me and I'll, I'll shoot you a copy of it. Uh, in addition to that, some additional resources, Roberta has a copy of, we've worked together to make a frequently asked questions for employers so that you guys can have that. Um, well, we can send you copies of that as well. So there's a lot more additional resources and more will be coming, I'm sure, from Boley as well as things get finalized. They're just not up yet, including a poster. <laughs> because that's what we need more of. Nobody needs wallpaper anymore. We just need Boley to keep working. We just <laughs> plaster it up. All right. So we're talking about accrual rates. Let's talk about it's 40 hours that they get. And you say, well, hey, no problem. I already give my employees 40 hours. That's easy. Well, you probably don't give it to them in the right way because Boley likes to micromanage things, if you hadn't noticed. So here's how they say to do it. You need to provide one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked. So, okay, well, that's not so bad. It's not so bad, except if you've got a full-time employee working 40 hours a week, they will have accrued all 40 hours of sick leave before July 1. So if you're saying, I give my employees 40 hours per year and I accrue it throughout the year, you're actually not giving it to your employees fast enough. So you need to be following there's two basic accrual methods. You can actually just accrue as you go, and it's one hour for thir every 30 hours worked, or if they're working 40 in a week, it's gonna be one and a third hours. Or you can give it to them in a lump sum. So at the beginning of the year, I'm just gonna give you everything that you're entitled to. Okay, one of two ways, either way is fine. If you're going to give it to them lump sum, there's a few things that you need to worry about, but there's also benefit to that. If you're going to give it to them in a lump sum, they obviously haven't earned it yet. So you say, well, what about my seasonal folks? I really don't want to give my seasonal folks leave in a lump sum. What can I do about that? You can, do them, you can have them on an accrual method where your regular full-time employees are sitting there and they get it in a lump sum. That's just a tracking issue for you. That's whether or not, from an administrative burden level, that's what I want to be able to do. Keep in mind that if you have it written in a policy somewhere, at least according to the new regs, that you can tell them, tell your employees you are not allowed to take your leave for the first 90 days that you work here. So they get accrual from day one. Now that's a change for a lot of folks in this room that, even, that offer 
sick leave or paid time off of any kind. For a lot of you, you say, hey, you've got to earn some stripes here. I'm not going to start giving it to you until after your introductory period of 90 days. Or I'm not going to start giving it to you until you've worked here at least a year. I've got enough turnover that I want you to stay here a year before I'm going to give it to you. And that's okay. You, you, can, you, you can do it that in a certain way. And I want to talk about paid time off. How many of you guys have paid time off policies instead of separate sick and vacation? Your life got more complicated. So, if you guys want to maintain a paid time off policy, what, especially for most of my agricultural employers, they say, you've got to be here a year before I'm going to start giving you PTO, right? You need to hold off a little bit. So if you want us to continue to offer PTO, I say you can do that. Give them sick for the first year that follows all these rules, and then year two, all that sick leave transforms into paid time off. Now you've got flexibility in how you use it. So paid time off can equal sick leave? Paid time off can equal sick leave. The law says that, hey, we need a bare minimum. The minimum threshold for employees is they need to be able to take time off for sick. That's themselves sick, serious health condition of family members, my kids sick, all that stuff. They say if you want to open that kind of leave up to more things, like vacations, you are welcome to do that. And the fact that the employee then decided to go on the hunting trip and exhausted all the leave, and now even though he's sick, can't take the time off, that's on the employee, not on you guys. You don't have to offer them additional leave just because now they're sick and they took the time off for, for vacation. We're not going to penalize employers for that. Yeah? So if you had a paid sick leave, would you require a doctor's note or you don't have to? Or they Good don't question. So, doctor's notes. When am I allowed to ask for it or other verification? So, first off, you can ask for doctor's notes in two situations. The first situation you can ask for, for it is when uh, an employee has been absent three or more consecutive days from work. So, employee sick, if you're closed on Friday, uh, Saturday and Sunday, if they're sick on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're, they're off. Monday, they come back, can't ask for a doctor's note. But if they're sick Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, now I can ask for a note. Next time where you can ask for a note is when an employee says they're sick and you suspect abuse. How do I suspect abuse? They're, take, they're extending their weekends, taking off Mondays and Fridays, or v extending vacations, or you find out from them that they've got a uh, a uh, picture on their Facebook page of them holding up the salmon that they caught on the day they were sick. Right. So, if you suspect abuse, you can do it too. But you want to have it in your policies that says, hey, if I suspect abuse, I'm going to ask for a no. What's the, like, is there anything retroactive you can do? Say you saw the same fishing picture and so you're like, hey, that was the sick leave. Good. Does that affect so can you do it retroactively? You can do it retroactively. You want to, I mean, but you need to be practical about it too. If a, an employee is sick and you're asking two weeks later for a doctor's note for something where they said they had the flu two weeks ago, are they realistically going to be able to get a note from the doctor? Probably not. But if you hear about the fact that they've got the picture on Facebook with the salmon, do you really need a doctor's note? I use it as an example because it's funny and also true a lot of times. But do you really need the doctor's note? No. I'm going to go say, hey, were you salmon fishing? I heard that you've got something on your Facebook page. Yeah, uh, well, I felt a lot better in the afternoon. <laughs> right. Go ahead. I want to verify those last four words there on that page, maximum 40 hours. Yes. If somebody works 3,000 hours in a year, right. they still only get 40 hours sick. That's right. People only, there is a maximum accrual of 40 hours so long as that's what your your policy doesn't allow for more. And that's for accrual and lump sum or just lump sum? That's for accrual and lump sum, but let me, let's me let talk about the differences between the two. What happens with accrual versus lump sum? So when you have an accrual policy, you say, okay, most people when they have a sick policy or even for PTO, they say, you need to use it within a year or you're going to lose it. It's use it or lose it. I want you to take it if you don't, because I don't want you accruing an infinite amount of leave. 
So they're accruing the leave and come January 1 of the next year, what's going to happen to their leave? They're going to lose it, right? And so if they lose their leave January 1 and they've got zero leave and they get sick, what happens? The whole point of the law has now been defeated. And so what the law has said is come January 1, you need to allow employees, if they've got it accrued and left in their leave bank, accrue and carry over up to 40 hours. So they get to carry over up to 40 hours, but you can limit their use within a year to 40 hours as well. So you can limit accrual at 40 hours, you can limit use to 40 hours. Carryover is also at 40 hours. But the reason why we're allowing them to carry over is because we want to make sure that they've got the full 40 or whatever they've been able to accrue carry over into January 1 of next year. Now that same rationale doesn't apply for a lump sum. So if I'm going to give everybody 40 hours on January 1, and this, again, we're assuming for the most part full-time employees, we'll talk about part-timers here in a second. I'm going to accrue you, your, I'm going to give you your entire accrual January 1. That same rationale doesn't apply. Employee has always got something on January 1, right? So there's no carryover required when we do it as a lump sum. That's the biggest advantage for doing a lump sum. That, and you guys don't have to worry about how many hours did an employee work. Was it 40? Was it 45? Was it 60? Because it's 60 hours in a week, I now have to accrue two hours. Right? Go ahead. How does this affect salary employees? Good. How does it affect salary employees? Salary employees, we assume, are working 40 hours a week, regardless of how many hours they actually work unless we want to assume that they're working less and trying to give them less than 40 hours in a year. If we want to give them less than 40 hours in a year, we actually have to start tracking their hours to make sure that their accrual is enough. So if they're only working 15 hours a year but we're paying them on a salary, whether they're actually still exempt at that point may be up for debate, especially when we get toward the end of the presentation. But if, as, if we want to pay them, give them less than 40, we need to track. If, if they're working 40 or more, just give them the 40 and we don't need to track anything. Okay? Go ahead. So, good question. So, what happens when an employee carries over their 40 hours? So, January 1 this year, employee starts working for you. They get their 40 hours throughout the course of the year. They haven't used any leave, right? Now, January 1 the next year, what happens? I'm allowed to accrue 40 more. I've carried over. I'm going to accrue 40 more because I'm limiting my accrual within a year to 40. And then I don't use, enough, I don't use that at all. So I've gone two years without being sick, which means, hey, good employee, right? Give them a bonus. Yeah. So, but I haven't used any of that leave. What happens now? I get to the next year. What am I going to do? 40. Carry over 40 more, right? I mean, they're going to lose 40 and you're going to carry over 40. Can I pay it out? It's kind of what you're getting at. I want to, I want to pay them a bonus. I'm going to give them a wellness bonus. Can I do that? You, you, not with those words, maybe. Um, you can if the employee agrees to it. So the law says it's very paternalistic, right? We're going to protect poor, innocent employees from you big, bad employers. And we're going to tell them if the employee agrees to the payout, they can get the payout. How many of your employees do you think would refuse the payout? <laughs> How many of them say, no, I'd really rather have sick leave in my bank? Mm. Not many. So. That's one method we can do. And that's a way to encourage people to continue to show up. I'm going to give you the leave. You can take it as leave, as paid leave, assuming you're 10 or more. Or you guys can, if you, if you don't want to take the time off, I will pay you that. Now I've got some employers that are saying, well, I don't really want to pay them all of that leave. I'll pay them 50 cents on the dollar for it. Can I do that? The law's not clear. I say if the employee is agreeing to it, it's probably OK. But there's some risk just because the law hasn't defined that situation. The assumption under the regulations as they stand now is that employers will agree to give out, pay out all of it, or at least an hour for hour kind of basis. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the not pay out, 
you can opt not to pay out any of it. You can do it as use it or lose it, but the lose it part is kind of two years down the line. Okay. So they carry you over have a maximum of 80 hours, right? A maximum of 80 hours, right. But they can't and, but, they, but you can limit their use to 40 within a year. So basically once they've accrued that 40 over in a year, it's going to be hard for them to get at that leave unless they're taking it the very front end of the year, right? If, they, if they're taking that leave in January, they're probably dipping into their reserve and then accruing more throughout the year. But now I've already used that leave and so the stuff that I'm accruing later in the year is going to have to get carried over into the next year. So they're always going to have a reserve that's carrying over into the next year. Uh, back here and then. For the sick leave, if you keep it just sick leave you don't on vacation, um, you don't have to pay them out. If they leave and don't use it, they lose it. Good. So at termination, what happens? You should all have a policy that says what happens, number one. The law says you do not need to pay it out at termination. The law says that for current paid leave already, whether that's sick, vacation, or PTO. But here are the cases that we've seen. Well, you did it for him and not for me. Why not? Why'd you do it for him and not me? I was the one that filed the workers' comp claim. It must be because I filed the workers' comp claim. Or you told me that you would pay it out to me. Saying, well, no, I never did, but now we're arguing about it. And if you tell somebody, if you have a policy that says, I will pay out your vacation time at termination, and you don't do it, what is that? Anybody know? Lawsuit, right? It's a wage and hour violation. Wage and hour violations come with penalties, interest, and attorney fees. We've had wage and hour claims that have come where we've had to admit that we've owed, there was one case where we had to admit two employees were underpaid by 50 cents a piece and settled with them both for $2,500 because of the attorney fees involved. Okay, wage and hour issues are no joke and there's, I would doubt anybody in the room has insurance for it. Maybe a couple, but wage and hour issues by and large are, at least for the settlement part, are going to be uninsured. You, you can get some insurance for that. And the fields program obviously helps you guys in the event of a lawsuit too. But you guys need to be very cognizant of the fact that these claims get to be very expensive very quickly. How many years do they have to come back each other? Kind of so what's the statute of limitations on a wage and hour claim? On overtime, if, if they actually are entitled to overtime, for most of your employees that's not going to be true, but if they are entitled to overtime, it's going to be two years. For just the regular wages, we're talking about a six-year statute of limitations. Okay. All right. And you did ask a question earlier about piece rate work. So what are we going to pay employees at piece rate? What are we going to give them when they go out for leave? We're, tr we're tracking hours and we're doing, so we're, we are tracking their hours, but what, what rate are we going to pay them when they go out on leave? For all other employees, you got an hourly rate, you know what rate you're going to pay them. It's whatever their current rate of pay is, is what you give them time off for, right? What about piece rates? Who's going to average what they're actually making and pay them that? Who thinks that's what you're going to have to do? Mm, I got... I got two very pessimistic people in the room. <laughs> the law says it's going to be minimum wage or whatever you set. So I would set a policy that says it's minimum wage for piece rate. I'm full of a lot more good news than I told you guys about, didn't I? I set, see, I like to set the bar really low. <laughs> and then any good news that you guys get is just bonus. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so are you talking about tracking the accrual and then communicating that with, and then paying it to them? When they actually were sick, so they come back and say, I want to use four hours of my sick wave for Wednesday. So how do you do that? So you don't know they already got that four hours of right. their 40 for the year. Right. So there are, there are the two issues. One is I'm going to have to track it and then I'm going to have to pay it. What do I pay it at? You know, how do I pay it? It's treated as, as wages. Right, so we're going to do all the standard deductions that we always do, including if they've got a garnishment, 
right? We have to always remember the garnishments or levies. Okay, and then for tracking purposes, when do we tell them that they're using it? The law says that we have to communicate with them at least quarterly about what their accrual and usage, usage has been, okay? For most employers, especially those that are using uh, an outside payroll company, you're just gonna put that on their pay stub anyway. So you're communicating with that every pay period. Okay, and so you're just, you've, it's tracked, and now I'm gonna deduct, and you're gonna see that you're deducted four hours of your sick leave on your pay stub. Yeah, a few more questions uh, in the back, and then we'll come up here. Can they take an hour at a time, or can you have a policy that says if you're gonna take a day, you take the full day? Great question. So what's the minimum increment used? And I will tell you, this issue is complicated. I'll tell you what this law says, and then I'll tell you some other complicating issues. This law says that minimum increment of at least one hour. So employees get to use it in minimum one hour increments unless you guys make it less than that. So you can't say, if you're gonna take the time off, you need to use it in a half day or full day increments. Can't do that. So one hour at a time. Except if you've got family medical leave, how many of you also are 50 or more and qualify under family, the Federal Family Medical Leave Act? A few of you guys? Good. So when you qualify for either OFLA or FEMLA, do you know what your tracking requirements are? Your, your leave use requirements? It's the minimum increment that you guys actually track. So if I'm paying people, I'm, I'm rounding to 15 minutes, you have to let people take off time to the 15 minute. So if I'm gonna take an hour and a half to go to the doctor, you need to give people an hour and a half of sick leave. And so I'll say, sick leave says one hour increments, except if it's family medical leave qualifying and you qualify under those statutes, and then it's whatever minimum increment that you're actually tracking. And for some employers, that's every minute. That may be one minute at a time. So if I'm gonna take off an hour and 37 minutes, you're gonna track it at an hour and 37 minutes. We got a couple questions up here, and then back. Yeah. I'm just um, on on that piece where you said it could be set at minimum wage, but if you're paying them an hourly wage of let's say 13, um, you have to pay your sick leave at that hourly wage of 13. Right. Right. You have to pay. So the rate of pay that you're going to give them is the rate of pay at the time they use the leave. So if they accrued it when they were making 13 dollars an hour, and they're now making 14, you're going to pay it at 14. Okay. So it's whatever they're actually making at the time they use it. You had a question? So, the workers' comp stuff, is this gonna be a vacation type pay or is this gonna be a regular whatever their normal job is? It's gonna be vacation type pay for workers' comp purposes, yep. Yeah, go ahead. So we, we have to just require, we cannot say we can't create policy in our annual is the same. Minimum half day, you cannot have a policy that says minimum half day or whole day. You need to say minimum one hour increments. School, so the state makes the rules and they can exempt themselves from the rules? <laughs> yep. How does that work with a salary employee? Because with a salary employee, if they're, they're half in a day, they're paid for the sure. because of their salary. So how is that? That sick leave work with a salary person. So, how does it work with a salaried em employee? So, if you actually have a salary, I use the words exempt. So, if they're actually exempt, if they are a salaried exempt employee, then you can say, all right, look, if they do, let's start with the basics of salaried exempt. If they are salaried exempt, their hours aren't going to fluctuate based on the number of hours they're actually working. So, if they do any work for you in a day, they need to be paid for the full day, unless there's some exceptions for family medical leave. And then you start tracking the hours and you say, okay, I'm gonna pay you some of your sick leave and now that you're out of sick leave, maybe I'm actually gonna be able to deduct from your wages. You wanna deduct and just track their hours. How many hours were you out today? And it's more or less on the honor system for them, right? Because if they work any time for you that day, you're paying them for the day anyway. Now all I'm doing is exhausting your leave so that in the event that you're sick for a family medical leave situation and you're out for full or half day, I have the option of deducting from your wages. Most employers don't just because it gets complicated and it's a morale issue and you know, uh, so it, in practice that doesn't happen much, but for, ex for salaried exempt, it's kind of one of those, eh, track it as best you can. Okay, go ahead. A comment on the question that she asked of how to treat the workers' comp. Yeah. If it's sick leave, 
you have to pay workers' comp on that. If it's paid time off, you do not. Yeah, I talk, I, you know, I don't know if offhand if, if it's... I have that issue with workers' comp, and I went to strictly pay time off. When it's paid time off, it's like vacation pay. Right. If it's actually titled sick leave, then you need to pay workers' comp for that. Which I was kind of worried about, because when we had our audit one of the times, and I had not even had quite, I had like zero training, but I think I know, and zero experience prior. So I learned about how holiday is included in whatever their normal job right. is. Right. And a lot of that stuff. And so basically, it just turns out that nobody, if nobody lobbied to make sure it was covered as a vacation type way, then you're just kind of out of luck. And the only thing that you don't rights. have to pay workers' comp on is vacation type or paid time off. Right. But if it's sick leave, if it's title sick leave, then you have to pay workers' comp on that. If it's title sick leave. That's so what I was kind of wondering if this you know, law of the sick leave changed that. So the. From my reading, and I don't remember if you've seen anything, Roberta, but from my reading, I don't remember any changes to um, the the chapters within. So, or Oregon Revised Statutes Chapter 656 deals with workers' comp, and there wasn't any changes that I can recall within that. So, my guess is that if if you title it sick, then you're probably paying workers' comp on it. If you're going to title it PTO, you may get out. But I talked to Safe about that, or Liberty, or whoever your your carrier is. So I just talked to Safe about that, and they said that there are insurance laws, so it's separate. Yes. If you have a PTO policy, you can have a space on their form if they're requesting the sick portion, yes. um, vacation, or a personal day. The only one exempt is vacation. So it's up to you to track and prove it to Safe for the three year period they request. Good. So, for say, and this is true for everybody. So the point here in the back was Safe is saying, track it yourself. And the only thing that really gets you disqualified from not having to pay is vacation. It's up to the employer to be tracking why employers are taking leave in the first place. And you should have a form or some system in place where when an employee calls in or is taking leave, you know why they're taking leave. Because if it's family medical leave qualifying, it is the employer's obligation to make sure that it's being tracked appropriately. Okay, so that's a little outside of the sick leave portion of the talk. But if you have, if you qualify with 25 or more employees for Oregon Family Leave Act or 50 or more for the federal version, it is the employer's obligation to track it. It's the employer's obligation to make sure they get it right. And if you're not getting it right, then you're, face, you're exposing yourself to potential liability, especially in the event that you guys decide to terminate somebody or demote somebody, especially for absenteeism issues. Okay, all right. And I get the question, well, what happens if that changes? What happens if you know, life changes for them and I need more help and we're, we're just getting the person to work more? Well, then you change how much leave you give them. You estimate how many more hours they're going to be working and then give them another lump sum dump. Go ahead. But you can offer both. It's just a tracking thing. You can offer your full-time employees the lump sum and your temporary or seasonal so you can all understand the other one as long as you track it, right? Right. So you can offer full-time lump sum, seasonal, the accrual method, and it's a creative way of getting around uh, make, giving your seasonal folks 30, 40 hours at the front end. Although for, for a lot of you here, if you give them 40 hours at the front end, is it going to matter a lot? For some of you, yes. If your season is longer than 90 days, then yeah, it can matter. But if your season is 90 days or less most years, you say, well, I might just give you 90 days so I don't have to worry about the, uh, the 40 hours because at, you're not going to use it, you're not even going to be able to use it for the first 90 days because my policy says so. Okay. Now I've been bringing up the policy a lot. You should have a policy in place. For a lot of you guys, you have policies in places already. And if you have one in place now, great, you're going to want to tweak it. And there's a lot of places where you want to tweak it, especially in the accrual rate. You want to make sure that you're accruing it properly. If you're, if you're doing it in an accrual method instead of lump sum, you're going to want to make sure that you've got your carryover. You want to talk about termination. Make sure that that issue is addressed. And by the way, we've worked with Roberta and developed a draft policy for those of you without anything. It's just plain sick. It's pretty much bare bones. And when I say bare bones for me as a lawyer, that means about a page and a half. Um, but it's, it's, it's the basics there. So if you want to try to integrate what you've already got, you can. I'd say it's trickier than you think as you start to deal with it. But Roberta's got a copy of the policy. You're welcome to contact her. You email me, I can send it to you as well. So uh, there's a draft around too. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you had that policy that you can't, couldn't, they couldn't use it the first 90 days, you 
you have to have that for everybody, though, wouldn't you? Uh, differentiate between your uh, full-time and your seasonal. So can you can you say to your full-time employees you get to use your leave right off right off the bat when you start, and for your seasonals you, you can wait the night you have to wait 90 days. You probably can, um, although I think for as a practical matter most employers are going to keep it consistent just from a from a fairness perspective. So you probably the law doesn't require you to treat them equally unless it creates we call it a disparate impact. So you have more Hispanic employees as your seasonal, and you're having more white employees as your full time. Now the white people get a better benefit than the Hispanic people. Is that is there anything wrong with that? So I would probably keep it consistent for that reason too. Okay. Yeah. So my so let's say our cherry group comes in is there. So, got a crew that's working two weeks and then they're out. I know they're never going to work more than two weeks because they never have before. They're my cherry crew. Do you have to track it, accrue it, do all that stuff? Yeah. Law doesn't make any exceptions. So what would I do? Well, I'm going to estimate that you're going to work a total in the next two weeks. I'm going to estimate that you're working a total of 100 hours or 120 hours, whatever it is. And so I'm going to allow you to accrue a lump sum of a grand total of three hours, which you're never going to ever be able to use. And I have to give you the poster. So the next part of this whole mess is the bully obligation. So this is part of the regulations where we have to announce it. So these regulations may not be final until after the law goes into effect, but what the regulations say now is at your, by the time you issue your first paychecks of 2016, you need to either send your employees a letter letting them know about this obligation, put a statement in with their first paycheck, or put up a poster. Or you can do all three, or two of three, but at least one of them. So you need to put, Bully is going to be developing a poster, it's not out yet. They're developing a poster now, they're going to give it to us so that we can give it to our employees. If you want to give them the same notice in their paychecks, you can. Go ahead. What if that first paycheck is on the third for the pay period of the prior year, 15th to the 31st? Right. So that first paycheck is really going to cover time from 2015, right? And it doesn't matter. They want employees to know at the first available opportunity that this is a new law that you guys are required to comply with. That they are starting to accrue sick leave now. Even if Bully doesn't have all their stuff together. Well, my guess is they'll at least get the poster out by then. And then I'm sure that Roberta's going to be emailing it around to let you guys know, hey, there's a poster around. Put it up. Yet another poster. Congratulations. Okay. All right. Uh, another question that came up. So I've got a seasonal crew that comes in. You know, I've got a couple of seasons where they're coming in, you know, two months and then three months. And uh, they keep the same crews rotating back, right? What do I do with them? There's a six-month rule here where if an employee comes back within six months, you have to put them back to where they left off. So I left with 30 hours of crewed leave. I come back with 30 hours of crude leave. I come back six months, one day later, I start back at zero. Okay. Go ahead. What if it crosses the annual? What if it, what if it crosses January 1? Doesn't matter. It's, it's a six month look back. Okay. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Good question. So if I pay it out when I leave, the statutes and regulations don't actually contemplate you guys paying it out because they say you don't have to. And so of course the legislature's assumed dirty employers, they're never going to pay it out because they're money grubbing people. My guess is that if you guys pay it out, and remember the, when's the only time we're allowed to pay it out to employees? If they, want it. if they agree to do it. So if an employee is agreeing that they're going to take the money and run, Give it to them, and I don't see it, for me, I don't see an issue with that. Give them the money. If they agree to it, good. Just have them sign a piece of paper saying that they're agreeing that that's it, and then when they come back, they're going to start at zero again. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All the rates make rights for the uh, six months, um, and they have it back in their bank, essentially. Uh, do they have to wait that 90 days before they use it? 
so or if you look back at the number of days. Good. Day. So do you have to wait another 90 days? No, we're putting them back to exactly where they were. So if they were in the middle of the 90 days when they left, you know, they, they're the employees that work for two weeks right now and now, oh, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to consider two weeks credited towards that 90 days still. It's like you're, you're taking a blind eye to the time that they took off. Go ahead, Roberta. It's 90 calendar days, so it's not working days. We're just, it's three months. Yep. Okay. Have we had enough fun with sick leave? Some of you are all saying, who had fun? Well, you almost have to keep a calendar on each employee. You, you basically have to keep a calendar on each employee, yeah. I mean, you have to know, you have to know, am I going to be bringing this person back or could I be bringing this person back within six months? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ban the box. Who's heard about ban the box? How many of you guys have applications that your employees fill out? Most of us do, right? I want them to fill out my application because I get to control the flow of information. What's one of the things I ask every employee? Have you committed a crime, right? New law starting January 1 says we're not allowed to ask that question on an application anymore. Okay? Here's the reason. We have prisons, correct? They're very full, aren't they? And who keeps going back into prison? <laughs> the same people that committed crimes before. How do we keep people out of prison? Best way to give, get people out of prison, reduce recidivism, give them jobs, right? And so this is the legislature's way of saying we want to get more ex-offenders jobs or at least the opportunity to get a job. Because what are employers doing when they see the application that's filled out and there's a check mark that says that they've been convicted of a crime? What do you do with most of those applications? File them. There's a round bin right next to your desk that you kind of throw them into, right? All right, so most people file them away. You never talk to the people. This is the way that the legislature said, hey, ex-offenders are good people. You should talk to them. What can you do when you get into the interview? If you do interviews. You can ask them when you get to an interview, if you do interviews. I don't care if it's over the phone. I don't care if it's Skype. I don't care if it's in person. I don't care if it's a group interview. If you do an interview, you can ask them, has anybody here been convicted of a crime? That's still legal. That is still legal to ask them. What the legislature wants to do, and it's important to understand the intent here, is they want to get ex-offenders in the door in the interview because they think that once you meet them face to face, it's going to be harder to tell them, no, you're not hired. That's the only intent of the, this bill. Yeah, go ahead. So on that, is that with no exception? Because the one thing we've done, we've actually worked with the work release in Clackamas, we've had some amazing workers out of that. And we just made one thing clear to them is there could absolutely not be any kind of file sent because we have our young children on the farm with us all the time. Good. So they would be around that. So is that something you can have on there? So is there are there exceptions to the law? There are exceptions where the law otherwise says. So if you're working in a group mental health home, so group home for uh, mentally disabled individuals. Yes, because state law otherwise requires you to say you can't be convicted of crime. You may not even be allowed to have been arrested. So we're not even talking about arrest records here. But for those kind of situations, we may say you can't even, may not even be allowed to be arrested to work here. So when you get into those kind of situations, yes. For you guys here, are there exceptions? No. Here's where it comes in. So the question was, well, what about me? I don't want to have pedophiles on site because we have kids around, right? Okay, fair point. But how does it come up? They still are allowed to come into the room, get interviewed. You say, what have you been convicted of? And they tell you. Now we have to go through, the EEOC has changed things a little bit for us. So on the federal side, one of their points of interest has been making sure that removing barriers to employment, including for ex-offenders. And so they've created a list that says, when you guys get somebody that says that they've been convicted of a crime, you need to do an individualized assessment. It cannot be a blanket assessment that says, I am not going to hire anybody that's been convicted of X or anybody that's been convicted of a felony. You have to instead say, okay, what was it? How job related is it? How long ago was it? Has there been any repeat instances of this person? Have they been able to keep employed without 
recidivating without doing that thing again. And then we take all that into consideration to decide whether to hire that individual. So the EEOC has made it complicated. And in fact, you know, uh, I've been in practice at my firm for nine years. In the first five, I don't think I ever saw a single case about people that are suing because they haven't been able to get a job. In the last four years, since the EEOC started this program, we see about one or two a year. So still not a lot, especially in light of how many people are being interviewed by employers annually. But at the same time, we are seeing an uptick in people that are suing because they're saying, I got excluded from a job because I was an ex-offender or because they thought I was a whistleblower or something else. Okay, so this is just another way where we're supposed to go through and say, I need to match things up. I have a bookkeeper that just got, a uh, person that's applying for a bookkeeping position who just got convicted of identity theft. Am I hiring him? Absolutely not. I have a general laborer that got convicted of a Dewey who's not going to have any access to keys to any of my trucks. Can I exclude him? No, probably not. So anything that where you have an, a crime of honesty and drugs are included as an honesty crime in most cases, you can say I'm not going to hire you because you were dealing or possessed cocaine or something like that. You can match up and say look I don't think you're honest and therefore and it was relatively recent and so I'm not going to hire you. Do you have to give them that answer? If they, ask, if they come and ask you why did you not hire me and those were the reasons you have to tell them why you chose not. Do you have to tell them why you didn't choo choose them? I'm going to give you my lawyer answer for that of definite possibility of a confirmed maybe. <laughs> The answer is going to depend on how you found out. So, if this is a self-disclosure from the employee, you don't have to tell them that's why you're doing it. You probably want some notes about that, about the fact that either you did or didn't consider it, and here are the factors that you use, because the EEOC expects that. If you guys are doing background checks through some agency, if you're getting a third party to go out there and do the background check, which General labor, seasonal folks, obviously you're not going to be doing, but for your full-time people, you might do that. Like a bookkeeping position, you may want to do it. And if you do, and you don't go through the background check process, and it comes out that there's a crime convicted, that they've been convicted of, and you want to use that against the person, you have to go through the Fair Credit Reporting Act procedures of telling them that I am using this against you, and that allows them to say, well, this agency got it wrong. This wasn't me. This was some other Tom Jones out there. Okay. So, depends on how you get the information. If they're disclosing, you don't have to tell them you're relying on it. If you're getting it from a third party agency, you do. Okay. All right. Other questions on ban the box? Criminal convictions. Okay. Good. All right. Best part of the day, get to talk about drugs. So, one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit is um, setting levels for testing. If you don't have a written policy that sets levels of testing, Oregon says that you, your minimum threshold is zero, which means that poppy seed muffin could set that off. Secondhand smoke from marijuana can set it off. So that's why you want to set minimum levels. And usually, we recommend generally following the uh, Department of Transportation guidelines. How many of you guys, by the way, have DOT employees? A few of you. So different rules apply. We're going to talk mostly about non-DOT, although there's some overlap. Um, if you want to talk more about DOT afterwards, we can talk about that. So mostly non-DOT here. Um, so we want to set minimum thresholds. We want to have a written policy. Now. Medical Marijuana Act. So Oregon passed Medical Marijuana Act 1998. We were one of the first three states in the country to allow for medical marijuana usage. Congratulations to us. It's been, so it's been quite a while that we've allowed for medical marijuana usage. And you've probably heard a lot of things over the last 15, 17 years about this from lawyers saying, hey, you have to accommodate use of medical marijuana. So under the Americans with Disabilities Act, we have to make exceptions to our policies to say it's okay to, we have to make exceptions to policies for disabilities, right? You don't have to be, uh, we'll make exceptions to dress code, we'll make exceptions to this, we'll make exceptions to that, because of your disability. And now we're, the question was, for marijuana use, did we have to do that? And the answer for a while was yes, because the Oregon Supreme Court said that 
as employers, we have to make accommodations. It wasn't until 2010 when the Oregon Supreme Court finally weighed in that they said, no, you don't have to make any accommodation for use of marijuana because it's still illegal under federal law. So the federal government for quite a while now has said, so long as you are using marijuana within whatever the state allows you to, including recreationally, we are not going to prosecute. So long as your possession and use is within state sanctioned limits, you're okay. We're not going to prosecute. So in a sense, it's decriminalized from a federal level. It's still on the books as criminal, but they're not going to prosecute. Okay? So the, the state rule, this, this time the more strict federal rule trumps the state rule. Yes? Well, they're not going to prosecute, but for us as employers, we get to enforce our zero tolerance policies under that 2010 case. So we have a zero tolerance policy, we get to continue to enforce a zero tolerance policy. Okay, so J July 1 comes around, everybody celebrates, right? We can now do marijuana recreationally, all your employees can. What has not changed? We know, according to the, the measure, employees do not have the right to smoke and come to work. We can still enforce our zero tolerance policies because it's still illegal under federal law to smoke marijuana or consume marijuana. Okay, What has changed though for us, the thing that's changed most is perception. How many of you guys have entitled employees? It's okay, it's a safe space, you can raise your hand. I think it would be easier to ask for Who doesn't have entitled employees? Yeah, there's even better. So, employees ha now know that it is their right to go and smoke or consume marijuana, right? So what we've seen is changing attitudes here. You can see it in Colorado and in Washington, the two other states that legalized recreational use before us. They've seen 20 and 23 percent increases in those testing positive for marijuana in the year after they passed the measure. So we're likely to see the same things here in Oregon. And that's actually probably a little low because a lot of employers just stopped testing for it altogether. What else have they seen? Not just marijuana use that's increased. Hard drugs, heroin especially, and in Oregon you've already started to see it. Don't want to talk about whether marijuana is a gateway drug or anything else. It's supply and demand. What have the Mexican cartels stopped doing? They're stopping to produce marijuana because it's not as lucrative because they've got legalized competition here in the states. So they're now changing gears, they're producing heroin, it's now becoming more plentiful, more cheaper, and so it's now being used more by your employees. So. So we're seeing, we're seeing the change of attitude for employees. We're seeing increased usage of employees, not just of marijuana, but other harder drugs too. So now's a great time to update your policy to say, hey, by the way, marijuana, still illegal. I can still fire you for it. Now I've got a lot of employers that have said, look, I'm not going to test my employees for marijuana. Because if I started testing employees, especially my new hires, if I were screening all new hires for marijuana, I wouldn't have enough people. And that's probably true. But at the same time, do you want to allow people to show up high? You want somebody to get in behind the wheel of a car or a tractor or a forklift while they've been smoking. So you want to be able to tell them, I can still test for this. If you're testing, if you don't want to test for them for when they're doing something on the weekend, okay, fine. I'm only going to use reasonable suspicion. Okay, you can. Well, we're still saying you can't show up to work drunk. We can say you can show up, you, you can't show up to work high. Here's the problem with marijuana, though. Well, we'll get to there. The problem with marijuana is we don't have a test that tells us whether somebody's high or not. Right? With alcohol, we know when somebody's drunk. You can get a breathalyzer, you can do, you can do blood work, right? Pee in a cup. There's lots of ways to tell whether somebody's actually currently impaired by alcohol. But with marijuana, the, the only thing that the test will tell you is if they've taken it and have it in their system. And it could be as long as 30 days ago. Or for those that are chronic users, even longer. Okay? 
So it stays and it depends on each person. The more water you drink, the faster it comes out. The more fat cells you have, because THC is stored in fat cells, the longer it's going to take to come out. So if you want to get around tests, be skinny and drink a lot of water. <laughs> Yes, so they're working, they are currently working on a test that will tell us whether somebody's currently impaired. It's very similar to a breathalyzer test, but we're probably not going to see it out for another, at least a couple years. So, there, right, so there are laws to say that you can't, you can't drive while you're impaired, but there were laws that say you couldn't drive drunk before there were breathalyzers for that either, so the, the police just used different tests. Just like we're going to have to use different tests, and one of the points we're going to talk about later, I might as well just talk about it now, is you need to have somebody that's trained to do reasonable suspicion testing, because how comfortable is everybody here in this room telling somebody that they think that they're drunk or high? Something's wrong and I'm going to send you to get tested. I've got one person in the back that's willing to send people there. They're comfortable doing it. Okay. So, for some of us, it's very hard, especially for your full-time, year-round people. I work with these guys shoulder to shoulder. I don't know that I'm comfortable doing it. I don't know that I'm comfortable identifying, knowing when something actually rises to the level of reasonable suspicion. Where is that? And when you're dealing with reasonable suspicion testing, which you're allowed to do, you send people to go get tested. How often are employers right? How many people pop positive under reasonable suspicion testing? Drug, the, the testing labs tell us it's about one in three. We, we did a, a surprise random test three years back. Well, guys, four tested positive. One out of three tested positive for you under a random test. But I'm saying even for reasonable su suspicion, when I'm saying there is something wrong here, they're still getting one in, only one out of three. So you're wrong most of the time, and it's okay to be wrong. There's no problem with that. But when you come back, get back to work, you're still dealing with, you sent them there for a reason, right? There was something wrong with the employee. So now we're dealing with that on a personnel level. You're saying, hey, look, I sent you there for a reason. We need to talk about that. Okay. All right. Real quick, because I'm really out of time. Um, edibles, edibles are very dangerous. Oregon has got a proposed rule to set what that level is. But by the way, this little cookie here, how many, this is under Colorado law that's got 10 milligrams of THC in it. How many servings do you think are in that cookie? Six. Under Oregon law, it would be 12. How many of you have ever eaten a twelfth of a cookie before? <laughs> One gummy bear per serving? Yeah, right. So, anyway, it, this is really dangerous. You've actually seen a spike in Colorado of marijuana over, overdose deaths. The last one was a 15-year-old girl who ate too much. These things are easy to hide, easy to consume, and people can be, can be high at work very quickly. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, when you do edibles instead of smoking it, it's actually much more potent. It stays in your system longer and the effects are even greater. Uh, there's a lot of attempts to beat a test. The point here is use a good certified lab. Don't get those take-home tests. Lots of good ways to beat them. The, the, the industry trying to beat tests, I think the last I heard was about a $3 billion a year industry. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we, we have lots of freedom to adopt the policies that we want to adopt. Uh, I've talked about reasonable suspicion. We can do pre-employment. You want to have a policy that details it out. In our, our form handbook, our drug and alcohol policy is by far our longest policy. It's about seven pages long. Next longest policy is about a page and a half. Okay. We can do random testing, we can do blanket testing. There's a lot of things you guys can do. You can even set what your reasonable suspicion standards are. I'm going to do it post-accident. Post-accident is a form of reasonable suspicion testing. And you may want to set what those reasonable suspicion places are going to be. Is it going to be when property damage occurs or is it going to be near misses? Sometimes people do that. So lots of flexibility there. All right. We're going to skip over most of the rest of this. We talked about sick time way too much, which I'm sure you're very thrilled about. But uh, the walkaways for you guys, get your policy uh, in place. If you want to beat an unemployment claim, there's a few points on this slide here that, that you should be aware of. Most of the time, if you don't have a policy in place, you're going to lose a UI claim. If you don't follow your procedures, you're going to lose that UI claim. Even if the employee decides to go to rehab after they get fired for a popping positive, they can still win. And the last point I was going to bring up, 
Even though they're called zero tolerance policies, does that mean that you have to fire everybody that pops positive for you? No, zero tolerance just means that I'm not going to tolerate the use, I'm going to discipline your usage of it. So am I going to treat marijuana differently under random tests than I'm going to treat cocaine? For some employers, the answer is no. For a lot of other employers, the answer is yeah, I'm, I am going to treat them differently. And I'm going to have them go through a series of follow-up testing and all that. So if you have more questions about testing, feel free to... Uh, come ask our policies what should and shouldn't be in uh, drug and alcohol policies. And with that, thank you for your attention.